but I love for you to see it in front of you. By the way, my name is John Wayne McMahon. I am one of the pastors at Marvin and lead pastor here in Core Worship. It is good to be with you and it's good to be back. I've been out a few weeks. I got to go down to the sanctuary and then my family were on vacation last week and that was wonderful. I'm thankful for a clergy team and for the staff that when one of us is away, uh, we're still ro- we're still running full speed all the time. And so it was wonderful. I've heard great things about uh, last week as well. The other thing I just want to put before you is if you're just coming in, joining us, if you haven't been here in the last couple of weeks, or maybe you're new or visiting, first of all, thank you for trusting us with your time here today or online, but also I want to catch you up that we're in the middle of a hospitality series. So that video, How Not to Greet, is part of uh, that emphasis over the last few weeks, and it was a funny way to get at, we're going to be talking about hospitality to strangers or visitors or people that we don't know, um, and maybe it's our first time to be around them. That's where we are today. A couple weeks ago, we started with the theology of hospitality. What does our faith tell us about hospitality? What does it mean to to be the body of Christ? What does it mean to be a part of the family of God and to bring hospitality into the world? That was our starting place. Then last week, we talked about hospitality in the family. Yes, our nuclear family, our family in our home, but the church family. What does it look like for us to love the brothers and sisters in one community together and to love them well today? Hospitality to the stranger. And next week, hospitality to the, if I had to title it, hospitality to the jerk. What is it? What does it look like for us to love people that are hard to get along with, right? What does it look like to love our, na- uh, love, love our enemies in the way that Jesus challenges us? So that's where we're headed. But today, hospitality to the stranger. And we get at that by looking at Acts chapter 8, the story of Philip the evangelist going to the Ethiopian eunuch. So hear the word of the Lord now. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. And the spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot, heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. And so he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks again for your presence here in this space. We pray that you would add your blessing to the reading of this scripture, your holy word. Where we are empty, would you fill us? Where we are weak, would you strengthen us? Where we are wrong, would you correct us? And would you send us out once more? And God, I pray for myself that you'd speak through me or in spite of me, but may it be your message that's delivered. We love you and trust you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Let all God's people say, amen. Have you ever been called to provide hospitality to a stranger? Uh, To someone in a surprise, you find this interaction, whether it's to give someone a ride or maybe help someone with a flat tire, or maybe it's someone in the grocery store line that their card declines in front of you, whatever it looks like. Have you ever been in those moments? Well, a couple of years ago, as a pastor, I get these opportunities, whether I see them or not is another story. But uh, a couple of years ago at the previous church I was serving, a young lady came into our church. And when she first walked in, you could tell that she had been through a lot because physically her appearance was different because she had severe burns all over her arms and her faces and she was fresh. And so her, the wounds were uh, very new. And um, a lot of times when people come into the church asking for help 
help with food or a place to stay, because of the, the quantity of people that we might see, we have to be careful about how we help and also the way that folks ask for help sometimes or the, the ways that we can help is not always what long-term is best to serve them and to come alongside them. And so we have, to, we have to be careful and we have to engage in those conversations differently so that we can love fully and love well for the person. But immediately, as soon as I saw her, I knew that, that God had us here to, to be in relationship with her and to help her along her way. And so she asked for help at, at a hotel that she was staying at because she wasn't able to work because of the burns and she was getting help in the hospital and so asked if we could help. So I said, of course, let's see what we can do. I'll follow you to the hotel that you're staying at so that I can see the clerk and we'll take care of a week and see if we can get some food and, and be on this journey alongside you. She was very grateful and cried and we prayed together. And then I get to the hotel and y'all, it was the worst thing I'd seen. I just couldn't believe this young girl in the state she was in was gonna have to stay in this hotel uh, by herself for the week, but it was where we were. And so we decided let's move forward. Let's get her a room. And, and I felt like, you know, we gave her some, some food, but I, I was like, we got to do something else. So I called Lauren and I'm like, Thanksgiving's right around the corner. Can we invite her to Thanksgiving? Can we make some food and bring it to her? And so it began the, the beginning of this relationship where we texted almost every day. We made a bunch of chili, I think, and took it over to her house and we made sandwiches and things like that. And, and we're trying to help her. And she shared that she was in recovery from an addiction and she was trying to get back on her feet and had no family. And so I'm just excited about what God doing to try and help her along her way. So we're trying to get a recovery group together. Uh, we're trying to invite her to church and then talking every day for weeks. And then all of a sudden she just disappeared. And I text her and I didn't get a response. And I went back to the hotel and she was gone. And, and I remember just being disappointed. Like I hope that she found a break and that she had gotten her feet underneath her, found somebody that could help her out or maybe a job in another town. But I just remember being disappointed because I felt like God was in the middle of this. Have you ever been a part of providing hospitality and then it doesn't work out the way that you had hoped? Maybe you have those stories where you have been able to provide hospitality or someone has provided hospitality to you and God brings it together in a beautiful way. Well, we're gonna see that in this passage when Philip steps out in faith, engages with someone he doesn't know because God tells him to and God shows up in beautiful ways. God calls Philip to go and provide hospitality to a stranger. And this is our focus for today. But I want you to see what's going on in the text because it's pretty wild to understand how radical this call is on Philip's life. See, Philip is one that's called to go on this journey, and he's been in the story of Acts a little bit for, for a few chapters, and he continues on for a little while. We see him come and go in the book of Acts. He's often been referred to as Philip the Evangelist. You might have heard him use that phrase when they describe Philip, and at the end of Acts, they actually call him Philip the Evangelist. And he, we, we see reason for that. Why? Because in the, in the chapters right before this and after it, he is being an evangelist. He's going to people is proclaiming the good news of Jesus. We first see Philip back a few chapters earlier when the apostles are overwhelmed with ministry in Jerusalem. And they have all of these people coming that need help and they just don't know how to plant churches to send people out. And so they begin to pray about how do we delegate ministry? And they ask for the elders to bring seven people forward. And one of the seven is Philip. And he begins his ministry by serving the poor in Jerusalem and the area around that. But then out of that ministry to the poor, Philip is the first missionary sent into Samaria. If you go back to Acts 1, the promise that now that the Holy Spirit is here, the gospel will go to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And that's who Philip is, the one that's bringing it there. Just before our section today, Peter and John leave Jerusalem just to go see all of the people that have come to know Christ under Philip in Samaria. And they pray for them. It's a beautiful thing. But then in our section, the angel of the Lord prompts Philip and tells him to go south on a desert road. Did you see how scripture was very clear to tell us this is a desert road and it's headed towards a desert place, right? It's because it's trying to draw our attention to something. Now, I have a picture of the map because I want you to see something. It's kind of small, but the green dotted line is this journey from Jerusalem down to Gaza. And there's actually two different roads that Philip could have taken. One that would be more of a direct route, one that wouldn't be deserted, one that would be a place where he would engage and be around people, but God sends him on this desert road towards a city, Gaza, that many scholars believe is deserted at this time, that there's no one there. 
And so it's a peculiar thing that God would take this evangelist to send him down a deserted road to a, towards a deserted city. And the other thing I want you to see is this guy was sent to the Samaritans, that he was sent to Samaria. And where, you, where do you see that? It's north. And God is now calling him to go south on a deserted road to a deserted place. What a peculiar uh, calling that is put on Philip here. This guy is reaching new people every day for the kingdom, preaching in this area that he's called to, and now God sends him the opposite direction to a deserted town on a deserted road. And friends, the first thing I want to say today is hospitality to the stranger always begins in being inconvenienced and being sent in a direction you didn't plan on and being in a place that wasn't on your agenda and slowing down your plans to see who's around you. And that's what happens to Philip here. And thank God he says yes, because we get to learn from his experience. So Philip responds to this absurd prompting and he heads out and he encounters this eunuch from Ethiopia riding in a chariot, reading the book of Isaiah, having just returned from the temple in, Israel, in Jerusalem. This is a fascinating encounter that we see because this Ethiopian, this eunuch, doesn't belong in Jerusalem, doesn't belong in the temple, and shouldn't be reading the book of Isaiah. And the Spirit tells Philip to go and go close to the chariot, and Philip hears what is going on. I want, you, I want to see some observations here in this text. First, because he's riding in a chariot, we know that this person is very wealthy and probably in the high courts of this Ethiopian queen. Not many would even have animals to ride on, much less a chariot to ride in. So it's an interesting uh, encounter that Philip finds. This person, though he is a Gentile, a non-Jew, he is what they call a God-fearer in Scripture. He's someone that's sympathetic. He's interested in this Yahweh God. He's asking questions. And it's even fascinating that he's coming from Jerusalem and the temple because he was likely turned away from the temple by Jewish leaders because he wouldn't be welcome there. And so it's a fascinating encounter. And he's reading Isaiah 53. Now, when you see in scripture these little references, it only references a couple of verses from Isaiah chapter 53, but really that's an indicator that he was studying that context. All of Isaiah 53, which is one of the most prophetic words pointing hundreds of years beyond itself to what Jesus does and accomplishes for the people of Israel. So here is this God-fearer, sympathetic person, maybe turned away from the temple, is riding on this road, the road that Philip was called to go on and he's reading this book of Isaiah. And let me just pause here and say, sometimes I get frustrated when I read this text because I wish it happened to be this easy for me when I'm providing hospitality to a stranger. Like, I hope you see everything is laid out. It's quite annoying. Like, think about it. Like, it starts off with the angel of the Lord appearing and saying, Philip, I want you to go that way. Like, Morgan Freeman's voice from heaven is like, go that way, right? It starts off, if only I could hear that word so clearly. And then the Spirit tells him to get even closer. Like, Philip could have encountered the chariot and go, I don't know why I'm here. That guy seems well off. Why would I need to share anything with him? And head back the other direction. But the Spirit of the Lord presses him to go further. And then he finds a brother who has traveled days or weeks to go to church, even if he was turned away, and he finds him reading this prophetic text of Jesus, and he asks Philip to teach me what it says. That's ridiculous. How many times have you encountered someone that are like, hey, I was wondering about the Trinity. Can you open up my eyes to this and show me some readings on this? I'm, I'm curious about what God might be teaching here. It's ridiculous. And then if it wasn't absurd enough, as he shares with him from the book of Isaiah, the uh, Ethiopian says, oh, look, here's some water. How about I get baptized? It's ridiculous. Why can it work in that like that for me? But here's the deal. Scripture has an economy of space. So what Scripture is not able to do is maybe to tell us the 150 experiences Philip has had where he's run into roadblocks, right? Where he's run into people that didn't receive his hospitality, where he thought the Spirit was leading him, but it was actually indigestion from last night's pizza, right? I don't know if they ate pizza then, but 
We, we don't get all of those. And the reason why this text lands in Acts is because it has some very intentional um, repercussions for what's going on. First, I want you to know that this has repercussions for the narrative of scripture. See, this man is going back to Egypt and the promise in Acts is that the gospel will reach all ends of the earth. And so when Philip brings this Ethiopian to meet Christ on that road to Gaza, he is then going to go into an unreached place, literally the ends of the earth to those that live in Israel and spread the gospel. So it has some intentionality there, but it also has some things that we can learn from it. But one thing I want to say before we jump into the meat of it is you are not Philip the evangelist, okay? A lot of times we like to drop ourselves into scripture and, and see ourselves as the character. And I want you to not rob Philip of the general context of what's going on, but we can learn from what Philip does and how God sends him into this specific situation. There are critical lessons of hospitality to the stranger here. So I just wanna talk about three in the next few moments. The first one I want you to see is that God cares more and before. God cares more for the Ethiopian and he is at work before Philip ever has this guy on his radar. Even before God sends Philip, God has been at work in the life of this Ethiopian. Who knows how the Ethiopian became sympathetic to Yahweh, this Yahweh God. If he serves a pagan queen in Egypt in a place where this faith would not be a natural tendency for him to be a part of, what life stories led him to this place? What hardship had he found hope on the other side of it? What compelled him to seek God when God's people would likely most most of the time, turn him away. See, God was at work way before Philip even has a clue about this man. And God sends Philip. And Acts is very clear about that. The main mover in Acts chapter eight is God. The angel of the Lord tells Philip to go there. The spirit of the Lord pushes Philip to go even nearer to the chariot. And I want you to see two important theological concepts here because I think they mean everything when we talk about hospitality to anyone but also to the stranger. One, we see prevenient grace at work here and we see the missio dei at work here. Prevenient grace is how we Methodists describe the grace of God that is working in a person's life long before they ever understand it, have language for it, or even are aware of it. See, the grace of God was at work in the life of the Ethiopian way before he gets there. The grace of God is at work in your coworker's life way before you start to try and figure out awkward ways to talk about Jesus. The grace of God is at work in your waiter's life way before you sit in their section. The grace of God was at work in my life before I was ever aware that he was wooing me and calling me to himself. The second thing we see at work here is the Missio Dei. It's Latin for the mission of God. That we believe that mission and evangelism are not born in church programs, but they're born in the heart of God. That God is at work in the world and he's inviting us to be a part of it. That they are not just things that we do, but they are places we go to join God in the very work that he's doing. And how does that change how we go about hospitality? If we believe that the love of God is already at work in the conversation before we get there, and that God's mission, God cares more and before for the person that you're being sent to. That changes it. And the other thing that we'll talk about again today is if he, Philip says, no, that's, I don't want to go that way. There's a more economical way that I can go. There's a better place for me to be. God would reach the Ethiopian without Philip. But Philip has the opportunity to be a part of what God's doing in this story. So the first thing I want you to see is God cares more and before. Secondly, hospitality to strangers requires going to strange places. Philip had to be ready to go to a place that was outside his plans, outside his agenda, and his perception of what he was supposed to do that day or that week or that season. Here's the deal. Y'all, we had a fun video today about how to greet people in church. And we've talked about name tags the last few weeks and how helpful they are to increase hospitality. But listen, friends, if you cannot be hospitable to the person sitting in your row or walking by you in church, it is like sitting in the chariot, listening to him talk about Isaiah and deciding to move on with your day, right? I don't wanna start with the low bar of let's wear name tags and be friendly, 
I hope we can do that. Now listen, there are testimonies in this room and experiences that people have had where they would say, I've not experienced hospitality here. And so we have to bring it up. We have to talk about that bar right here. But what I want us to do when we talk about hospitality to the stranger is I wanna raise this bar because we're called to go into strange places where most people would turn away from. That's where we're called to go. And that's where Philip goes. Y'all, I hope we can be friendly to those next to us, but I wanna call us higher. What we learn from Acts 8 is that the people of God are called to bring hospitality in strange places, to hang out in places you wouldn't normally go, to strike up a conversation in the grocery store checkout line, to look your waiter in the eye today at lunch instead of being so grumpy because you're taking too long to get your seat or to get your food because they're understaffed and asking how that person's doing because they're probably having a crummy day because they're understaffed, right? Right? Hospitality starts with us not objectifying people, but to see people in front of us. It means getting out of your circle of friends to go to coffee with the person God has brought into your path instead of being with the same circle all the time. They're gonna love you if you cancel Monday night football or whatever plans you have and go hang out with this other person. It's okay. If they're not, then you need other friends, right? But what if we take a step and get outside of our comfort zone and to hang out and see people that are around us? Hospitality requires us going to strange places. Third, hospitality requires proximity. It requires that we're close, not the uncomfortable too close in your space that we saw in the video, right? But life proximity. I love that the angel of the Lord sent Philip, but then he gets down the road and the spirit says, look at verse 29 again. The spirit told Philip, go to the chariot and I want you to stay near it. He could easily say, just get closer. And what happens when Philip gets closer? He's able to ask a question that brings proximity. Do you know what you're reading? And because he's close, the Ethiopian says, Who could, how could I know unless someone tells me? Proximity is an invitation to be there when they come asking. There are people that have been in our lives, in Lauren and I's lives, that go way back, like pre-Jesus days. And we're just trying to keep proximity there because our experiences have been when crisis happens, when they don't know where to turn, we often get a phone call out of nowhere. Hey, I don't know how to make sense of this. And that opportunity comes from proximity. I saw a pastor share a quote this week on social media that said, you cannot wash someone's feet from a distance, which is so true. And another friend who's Christian, and this is pretty ironic, uh, thought he was being funny when he responded with that, sure you can, with a water hose. See, in his humor, I mean, I get what he was going for, but in his humor, he missed the irony that he was actually robbing the sacrificial and relational intimacy of washing someone's feet. See, when Jesus tells his disciples to go and do likewise after he's washed their feet, he's not asking them to make sure humanity has the cleanest feet. He's asking them to give the gift of proximity to be close in relationship. He's telling them that proximity to another is the way of the gospel of hospitality. And I just wonder how many of us spend our days washing feet with water hoses. Because getting closer would require sacrifice and inconvenience and it's costly and it could end to not the way you thought it would end. And it can go down dead end roads and it can hit roadblocks. But that's not who we're called to be because our Lord got down and washed our feet our Lord went all the way down so that we might be brought to him. And here's the deal. What I want you to see in these is these three build on each other. God cares more and before hospitality comes in strange places and hospitality of proximity. Because listen, church, if you mix, if you skip out on strange places and if you avoid proximity, then you will miss what God is doing in the world. Y'all, I can't tell you how often in my office is not some crazy, like life altering, my life has fallen apart thing, but more often than not, people come to my office and say, John Wayne, I just don't experience God in my life. I just don't hear him. And the first question I always ask is, are you hanging out in places where he hangs out? 
Because if he says, I've come for the least, the last, the lost, I've come for those that the world turns away from, I've come for the margin, I've not come for the healthy, I've come for the sick. If we're just hanging out in our healthy little clubs, then we're missing what God's doing in the world. If we don't go to strange places, if we don't get outside of our comfort zones, and if we don't live into that gift of proximity, then we will miss what God is wanting to do. God is gonna meet the Ethiopian. God is gonna make his way to Egypt. God is gonna get to the ends of the earth. He created the earth. He will get there. But the question is, will we be a part of it? Will we experience that? One last question I have this text is what motivates Philip? What motivates us? Why would we do this? Why would we step out of our comfort zone? Why would we sacrifice and give from this place? Why does Philip stick his neck out, inconvenience himself and go to strange places and get close to people he does not know? Well, we have to go back to where we started a couple of weeks ago and that's a theology of hospitality. See, Philip believed as Paul wrote in Ephesians. This is what we preached on two weeks ago. Paul says, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but your fellow citizens with God's people and also members of the household. You're built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. See, Paul says it, Philip believes it, that we were once far away and we're not anymore. We are now citizens of a new kingdom. We are now in a new family and we are a temple that God is pleased to dwell in. How we prioritize, who we spend time with, where our money goes, where our weekends go, it is different than the world around us because we've been brought near to him. Things have changed for us. And I just wonder how many of us actually believe what the grace of Jesus is offered for you or has done in your life. Maybe the reminder is how far we were and how near we are so that we might go and bring others in. See, listen, friends, it makes us feel good to have a full room in here. I love having all these people in here. I love having third graders here. But our desire can't be just to have a full room here because we can fill this room with people who don't know the grace of Jesus Christ. Our goal has to be bigger than that. Let's raise the bar. Let's take hospitality to the stranger. Let's go to the least, the last, the lost. Let's go to the margins. Let's hang out in the places that God is hanging out in. Kevin Watson, uh, author, he's a Wesleyan scholar, wrote a book on the class meeting and there's a group of us that are studying it right now and he says this. In our context, one of the great challenges American Christianity faces is that salvation seems unnecessary to many Americans who feel that they are the source of their own life and security. But the gospel is only good news to those who realize their need for salvation and that only God is able to save us. The good news is that God is able and he's willing to save. See, friends, if we don't believe this good news that he saved us, if we believe in the false gospel that our own security and our own future is right here in our control, then we won't go down this journey. We won't go down the deserted road. We won't change our plans to go in that direction. But if we have a high view of what Christ has done in our life, then I bet we'll go to some strange places. May it be so in all of our lives. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let all God's people say, amen. Friends, I wanna invite you to stand. We respond today by saying the, uh, the Apostles' Creed, this historic creed that directs our worship, that joins us together with these words. Let's say them, you'll see them on the screen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.